Some breaking news here. Moments ago, AOC filed articles of impeachment against two Supreme Court justices, Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. The articles against Clarence Thomas include failure to disclose financial income, gifts and reimbursements, property interests, liabilities and transactions, among other information, refusal to recuse from matters concerning his spouse's legal interest in cases before the court, refusal to recuse from matters involving his spouse's financial interest in cases before the court. And the second impeachment resolution includes the following impeachment articles against Justice Alito, refusal to recuse from cases in which he had a personal bias or prejudice concerning a party in cases before the court, failure to disclose financial income, gifts and reimbursements, property interests, liabilities and transactions, among other information. Now, to be clear, these articles are not the result of a decision handed down by the court, since that's clearly not an impeachable offense, even if it does show overt corruption. They are the result of the justice's conduct around the office. Here's MSNBC's Ryan Noble explaining that point. These articles of impeachment are not based in any of the decisions that either of these two justices have made, but instead specifically about their conduct around the office. For instance, uh, in both Thomas and Alito's case, she is accusing them of not properly disclosing uh, financial benefits and gifts that they were given uh, by donors and others, and in some cases, people that had business before the court or even had a vested interest, a political interest, in some of the issues before the court. And she's also uh, doing that in the case of Clarence Thomas, saying uh, that he refused to recuse himself from certain cases that his spouse had a vested interest in as well. His wife, Ginny Thomas, of course, uh, was very much involved in the Stop the Steal effort, the efforts to overturn the 2020 election, and things along those lines. Also, uh, she is accusing uh, Justice Alito uh, as well of refusing to recuse himself from certain cases of which he may have a conflict of interest. So this, these are very specific accusations that Ocasio-Cortez is leveling against these two Supreme Court justices. It comes at a time where Democrats are getting increasingly frustrated about the direction of the court. Obviously, the decisions that the, this court has rendered over the past couple of months, but also the conduct of these Supreme Court justices and the lack of oversight that they apparently seem to have uh, without any kind of specific code of ethics that they, they must follow. Now, I do need to say that this motion will not pass the House, which of course has a slim Republican majority, but that is not a reason not to exercise what power you do have to draw attention to a serious issue. And the issue of these conservative justices abusing their positions absolutely warrants attention. Remember, House Republicans have spent the last 16 months investigating Joe Biden for quite literally Nothing. There is zero evidence of any crime. And what evidence they have brought forward has blown up in their faces, including a 1023 form that was filled out by someone who would ultimately turn out to be a peddler of Russian disinformation who would be indicted by the FBI for lying. And yet still, for more than a year, Republicans have perpetuated the narrative that Joe Biden is corrupt by virtue of these hearings that they've held. And in doing so, they've convinced a whole half of the country that he's done something wrong, even though, again, there doesn't exist a shred of evidence to actually back up their claims. But that is how using one's platform can influence the narrative. And that was for something completely baseless. Imagine if Democrats used their platform when legitimate corruption existed, which is exactly the case with these Supreme Court justices. So good on AOC for using what limited power we have from the minority and highlighting an issue that absolutely needs to be highlighted. In fact, it's not just AOC. Just yesterday, her fellow Senate Democrats, Sheldon Whitehouse and Ron Wyden, sent a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland requesting that he appoint a special counsel to determine whether Clarence Thomas violated ethics and false statement and tax laws. The request for a criminal investigation is over gifts that he received that included travel, a loan for a recreational vehicle, and other benefits from wealthy benefactors, which of course included instances of jet travel, yacht trips, home renovations, tuition, luxury sports tickets, lodging, among other gifts not disclosed on his financial forms. According to their letter, White House and Wyden went on to explain that the failure to disclose these gifts and payments may have violated a federal law requiring government officials to disclose gifts, loans, and other benefits. They also want to know if Thomas's benefactors paid gift taxes and whether Leonard Leo's payment to Ginny Thomas was part of a coordinated gift program or required any additional disclosures by the justice. And look, 
Same deal. Will Merrick Garland appoint a special counsel to investigate Clarence Thomas per the request on this letter? Your guess is as good as mine. The fact that he hasn't done so thus far is a testament to his unwillingness to actually be aggressive and wield the power that he has. In fact, his entire tenure has been marked by his reticence to hold power to account. Consider the fact that the DOJ has prosecuted more than 1,000 January 6th insurrectionists and yet zero responsible for actually inciting them. Which is not to say that the rioters shouldn't be held to account because they absolutely should, but the notion that the foot soldiers should be prosecuted when no one who actually incited them to be there really does betray the government's fear to actually wield some power and send a message. Which I would argue is the most important point, because unless the people at the top are held to account, there is no disincentive to do it again, and that is the important part. There will always be suckers and rubes out there who Republicans can get good and angry and incite to violence, and we're seeing that right now, even with the ongoing prosecutions. But so long as the folks at the top know that they're untouchable, which seems to be the case right now, they will keep using violence as a political tool, and that is the most dangerous part. The point I'm trying to make is that even if these articles don't amount to impeachment, that doesn't mean we don't try. Take for example what Dick Durbin said after the upside down flag incident with the Alitos. He said, quote, no, we haven't got anything planned. I think he's explained his situation. The American public understand what he did, but I don't think there's much to be gained with a hearing at this point. I think he should recuse himself from cases involving Trump and his administration. And if Alito refuses to recuse voluntarily, Durbin said, quote, there's no recourse other than impeachment and we're not at that point at all. And with all due respect, that is dead wrong. Just because you don't foresee an easy route to the end result you want, doesn't mean you just allow corruption to continue. Worst case scenario, if you have these hearings, the American people can get a better sense of the corruption and ramp up the pressure to do something about it. Maybe we pass an ethics bill as a result of this. Maybe we get a majority in the next Congress, and then there's a predicate already to execute a successful impeachment. But the only way we get there is if we start this process now, and it is a process that is worth starting. Good governance isn't just seeing that we don't have a majority and throwing your hands up in the air while allowing corruption to continue. Good governance is taking it on head on, doing the right thing, and being willing to fight, even if it's not going to be an easy avenue to get there. And until we start acting with some urgency, we're not just allowing corruption to continue, we are actually encouraging it. So good on AOC for taking action, good on White House and Wyden for taking action, and if any more Democrats do the right thing, especially as it relates to the Supreme Court, then I'll highlight them too. We need there to be an incentive structure for Democrats to do the right thing. So call AOC's office in DC and thank her for filing the articles of impeachment. Her number is 202-225-3965. Again, that's 202-225-3965. Give her a call and thank her. Just as important as decrying the weakness of folks who refuse to do their jobs is to applaud those who do do them. In the meantime, our job remains the same. Keep demanding accountability for a corrupt Supreme Court that views itself as being above the very law that it's sworn to uphold. I've got a really exciting announcement. I've written a book. It's called Shameless. This book explores how Republicans have exploited their historical branding while attacking our democracy, how the media has proven itself a willful participant, and how Democrats can learn from this to rebalance the political scales and save our democracy. It has been a lifelong dream of mine to write my own book, and so I'd like to ask you to pre-order it by clicking the link right here on the screen. And if you buy within this pre-order period, your book is going to come with a signed nameplate. As you know, I've never had a single sponsor on my channel. I don't ask for money or anything like that. That, but if you're looking for a way to support me, this is hands down the best way to do it. So again, follow the link right here on the screen and thank you from the bottom of my heart for pre-ordering Shameless. And as always, make sure to subscribe to see more of my content.